Welcome to The Road. This is a weekly podcast of All Saints Lutheran Church. I'm your host, John Pedersen, and I serve as pastor. Each week, we reflect on faith, life, and navigating the road ahead. The language of journey is common when we think about life. It has its joys and challenges along the way, and we all need a little encouragement and guidance at times to keep us going. There's a word in the Bible, asphalia, which means truth, but it's the same root word we use in English for asphalt, if you can believe that is a solid surface that makes travel easier and more assured. And so every week we're going to be exploring elements of faith and life that keep us on the road. Faith isn't about living a perfect life. It's about finding our way, getting through rough spots, but seeking out those great vistas too. You can find my weekly message here, but you'll also find special conversations with guests who have insights on things like wellness, parenting, and living with unique purpose. If you appreciate this podcast, remember to subscribe where possible and share it with a friend. Here's this week's message. Well, do you ever feel overwhelmed? (laughs) Overwhelmed by the amount of work you have to accomplish, maybe by a set of challenges that you're facing? So many recovering, obviously, from Hurricane Ian today have to feel overwhelmed with the amount of work that needs to be done to salvage whatever is, might be left of their property and communities and to find their way through the complicated decisions about rebuilding or relocating or whatever that may be. There are many government agencies and nonprofits moving into Florida in particular, trying to offer assistance All of those stories of rescue and aid offer us a picture of grace in the midst of overwhelming circumstances. But to stand alone and look upon the destruction of a storm or a monumental task of any kind can be enough to test anyone's hope. You can only just make a start and do something. There are plenty of other challenges that can test our hope and faith today beyond our ordinary day-to-day responsibilities. All of the issues that confront us like war and division between nations and peoples, the well-being of our society and planet. In Luke 17, Jesus says something that makes the disciples feel overwhelmed. They see a huge gap between the way things are and how they need to be. And they say to Jesus, increase our faith. Whatever faith we have now isn't enough. We can't do this. And what was it that Jesus had said to get that kind of response from them? He tells them that if someone sins against them and then repents, they need to forgive them. And he says, if that same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. That's what overwhelms them. It was their inner struggle to remain whole on the inside in the face of it all, to remain gracious and merciful and not become hardened in their inner soul, to avoid becoming the very thing they've been wounded and hurt by, faced with repeated wrongs against them. How can they do it? Increase our faith, they say. It doesn't matter if it's an outward struggle or an inner one. We all face something seemingly insurmountable. And the question is how we make it through it all with healthy souls remembering that we are beautifully and wonderfully made. If external threats and worries overwhelm you, can you pause and find strength in the assurance of God's calling for you to step forth, to simply act and do something, to serve, to contribute your own brushstrokes to a picture of grace? Jesus tells the disciples not to get weighed down or stuck on the size of a task. He says, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and plant it in the sea, and it would obey you. Faith is not a question of amount. All you need is the smallest kernel, just the hope and confidence to act, to do something. With faith, the impossible is possible. There's no clear reason, by the way, why Jesus picks a mulberry tree other than it was right there in front of him um, when he was talking with the disciples. I don't know a whole lot, actually, about mulberry trees. Um, However, there is one on one of my walking routes that I pass, and it has a lot of berries, and they coat the sidewalk during the summer, which is why I tried to figure out what this thing was. (laughs) 
Um, and the, some of you might have what I have, it's a little app. You know, you take a picture of the, the tree or the plant and it tells you what it is. I, I think that's cool. Uh, it's a big tree, the, the branches were hanging down kind of close to the sidewalk, so I took a shot. Um, and, you know, according to the app and the, the leaves and the berries, it, it's got to be a mulberry tree. Um, and if the app says so, it's true, right? <laughs> Makes sense to me, it shows other pictures of mulberry branches and berries, and they look the same. Technically, the app says it's a white mulberry, also known as a common mulberry. Apparently, that's an invasive uh, tree, not, re not supposedly original to this area. It could be, though, I suppose, a red mulberry or a hybrid between the two, which is, apparently happens in Minnesota. I guess I did learn a few things about mulberry trees. Um, but I do believe that's what it is based on a single picture that an app identifies. And for my purposes, with little invested in the question, it's good enough for me. It was Im if it was really important to me, you know, I suppose I could get an arborist to tell me or even get a DNA sample to prove it. But that's one of the challenges we face today in our society is agreeing on what is true, right? I mean, how do you determine what is true? And not just what to call a tree or what the tree is, but the bigger issues of the day that are more consequential. How do you avoid ending up in an insulated echo chamber when you only listen to the sources of information you listen to, the apps you use, and block out anything that conflicts with it? I spent a whole series called Enlighten Me pursuing this question back at the start of 2021. The most recent edition of the Journal of Lutheran Ethics has an article on the same question. What is the church's faithful response to conspiracy theories, which are essentially a form of an ancient philosophy, or you might call it heresy, called Gnosticism? Author Jesse Walker traces the history of conspiracy theories throughout America's past, even to a time in history before we were a country. And the very first conspiracies that were embraced here concerned indigenous tribes and their supposed secret plans to kill colonizers. Walker tells story after story of conspiracy theories that have held the attention of various groups in our country throughout history and from time to time, large swaths of the population. He writes, pundits tend to write off political paranoia as a feature of the fringe a disorder that occasionally flares up until the sober center can put out the flames. They're wrong. The fear of conspiracies has been a potent force across the political spectrum from the colonial era, era to the present in the establishment as well as at the extremes. Conspiracy theories played major roles in conflicts from the Indian Wars of the 17th century to the labor battles of the Gilded Age, from the Civil War to the Cold War, from the American Revolution to the War on Terror. They have flourished not just in times of great division, but in eras of relative comedy. They have been popular not just with dissenters and nonconformists, but with individuals and institutions at the center of power. They are not simply a colorful historical byway, they are at the country's core. In the same article, author Matthew Best asks how Christians and the church as a whole are supposed to respond to this challenge of conspiracies and defining what is true in the end. Among his insights is this. The point isn't to debate the truthfulness of the conspiracy and prove it wrong, which someone who believes in the conspiracy may see as an attack on their very identity. Instead, it is to reach and reconnect with a person with care at a human level, to remind them of their humanity, to see the image of God in them, and to bring the gospel to them so they can be freed. The gospel doesn't hide in secret knowledge. Jesus doesn't set facts free. He sets people free. The gospel frees us from things that bind us. We are called to be Christ to others. His truth is more than just what is right intellectually, but rather also that we are to be in relationship with one another, 
because our relationships with others are reflections of our relationship with God. That point about doing more than getting things right intellectually is kind of a challenge for me. (laughs) It's hard to remember. I like to believe that feeding people more information will make a difference. You know, if I can just explain things a little clearer and a little longer, uh, lives will be transformed. I stand up here every week and I'm trying to do that, taking wisdom from scripture and from Jesus that may not always seem immediately relevant or convenient or even wise by contemporary standards. Does that persuade anyone? I guess you can tell me, maybe after the service. (laughs) But I don't think I'm alone. If someone doesn't listen or hear us, a common response is just to say it again, and then louder, (laughs) and then more insistently. But Matthew Best's point is that just ratcheting up the debate generally won't convince someone. If anything, it can just deepen their resistance. By all means, we need to speak the truth. But wisdom only comes to rest in our hearts over time and accompanied by love in relationship. Wisdom, in the end, is friendly more than adversarial. Sometimes I do wonder about the language we use to talk about our efforts to take on the impossible. You know, we often say we need to fight for something. We need to fight for a life or death cause. I've used that language myself on many occasions, fighting for something, fight for what matters. Do we need to fight? Is that even effective? Maybe. Maybe it allows us to win in the short term and that can matter, but I wonder if it wins hearts in the long run and at what cost. I wonder if it's better to devote ourselves to a cause, to devote ourselves to service and to the neighbor. If you're fighting for something or if you're devoting yourself to something or someone, are there different emotions that are stirred up in you that accompany those two imageries? Does one prepare you to honor the other person more, even someone who disagrees with you? If you're devoting your time and energies to something, does that help you pause and be present in the moment more? Perhaps to sit with someone you disagree with and hear their pain or fears and find a way to be present in that? You might gain greater insight into the cause you care about, and at some point you may also earn the right to represent your truth more effectively and caringly, and be heard. Faith puts aside our sense of being overwhelmed, anxious, threatened, and it calmly proceeds. It allows us to see our responsibilities, to be patient when everything we hope for is not yet seen, to simply believe that when we're doing what's right, loving God and loving our neighbor, listening and devoting ourselves to what God has called us to do, all things will be possible. It's not magical. It's not a guarantee. In fact, perhaps in faith, what we seek will be changed. Our perspective of what is possible will be even widened. Know this. You are a child of God. Loved. God has given you the faith you need to bring hope, to love others, to face whatever challenges are before you with grace. Amen. That's this week's message. You don't have to navigate the road ahead alone. You can join with others at All Saints. Visit allsaintsmtka.org for more information. Have a great week. Have a great week.